Amen. <clears throat> well, welcome. Once again, we move forward as we get closer and closer to Easter, and we've got this taste of spring. It doesn't know what it wants to do outside. One day it's cold, one day it's warm. And the seasons, we know it's going to get warm one of these days, but as we press forward, we know for certain that, you know, spring is on the way. Amen? And because of that, uh, it doesn't matter what's going on outside. You know that as the days pass, the cause and effect of spring will have its way. And so sometimes things in our life are that way. They, they appear differently than maybe the season of life you have thought it should be. And I think a lot of times we struggle with our own perception. And we don't consider what God might do through circumstances when he changes things up. He can change the circumstances and make them change out of nowhere. And as a result, what was your normal everyday life in an instant can be different when God's involved. Amen? In an instant. You don't even see it coming. You don't know how it could possibly be. But yet he does it, right? Well, in the co course of this uh, journey of faith here with Families of Faith Church, we've had some milestones that we got to see uh, over the years. And one of them that I remember very clearly uh, was a time that we were delivered from some circumstances that were unbearable for the, the congregation, if you will, to handle in and of themselves. We had just put this red iron frame up that was, you're now sitting in the sanctuary, but this was a red iron frame. And uh, in the other gymnasium at the other end was a red iron frame, and everything in the middle of that was stick-filled. So that it's standing here, and the lumber's on the ground, and the economy hit the bricks. And they had a lot of bad loans out there for housing. And the bank called home the construction loan. Wasn't in default. They just said, we're not interested in having a loan on that building. You're going to have to find your financing somewhere else. Well, for this little church, that sounded like certain doom. Because if the bank that we had the loan with was calling it home, there's, there wasn't a line of banks in line wanting to sign up for that, right? And I remember, I remember the days clearly. It was my first mentor that had an influence to be able to buy out the loan from our bank and move us forward. Now, that being said, this is somebody that, from my rough and rowdy days when I first got saved, the very first individual who spoke into my life, that's who it was. And that guy, he's an amazing, Jerry Volk's his name, an amazing individual. But I remember the days and how intense they were because we were, you know, in this rut, if you will, and we couldn't see how you could possibly get out of it but God, right? But God, God does amazing things. That, that an encounter, the way that it came to be, and it, it's much too large of a story to go into in detail, but to just tell you that to have that happen, what I wanted to refer to is not about that story as much as it is, is one of the church members at the time that was a prayer warrior and also was part of a, a Bible study that Karen Bland was teaching at the time, Pastor Randy's wife. Um, she was teaching this Bible study. was out of uh, Max Licato's uh, one of, a study called The Grip of Grace. She believes that's what it was called. I called him and said, Tell me something about this, this story of when, when this prayer warrior of ours had written on a rock the word nevertheless. And we have a photo of that rock sitting on top of the, 
the loan documents that we bought out from underneath the bank that was calling that note home. Well, obviously, you can see you're sitting in the sanctuary all these years later, and that that's in our rearview mirror and good and far. Amen. And uh, God did something. But I remember the impact of the word, nevertheless. Tonight, I just have some thoughts that I want to share that in the course of life, a lot of times we try to figure out what is the next step that God is going to do in and through our lives. And so we try to calculate using, maybe maybe using the scriptures and, and everything that God has given us on the journey, trying to put it all together and calculate something that all the puzzle pieces aren't there yet. There's a nevertheless that has to come into place. Amen? And sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow in our lives. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I remember the days, even after the fact, I remember months on end, the pastors getting together prayerfully and asking each other, what did God give you today in your devotion time? And we would try to systematically take the studies of each one of us and put together this mosaic picture of the direction of God. Months on end. Months on end. It would seem like a journey that would never end. But you're, here we are today. And it's in the rearview mirror. I want to take a look at Exodus chapter 3 to give us some an understanding of of a, for a backdrop. So Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was tending the flock of, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert, and he came to Herod, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, And behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So then the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet and place them. The place that you are standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the out." oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters for I know their sorrows so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up from that land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Prizites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, I will send you to the, to the Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And what should I bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of our fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. So there you have it. God heard the cry of his children, and he's got a plan. He says, I've come down, and you're going you're gonna to bring them out of there. Amen? All right, and so Moses is already looking at it and saying, who am I that I should go to tell Pharaoh this? Say, who's this bozo coming in to tell me anything, right? You're going to need to have an endorsement to be able to get that done. God says, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. <clears throat> You're going to go get my people out. So that's the passage of Scripture I wanted to share to take us into a different passage of Scripture. Now you understand, God's telling Moses, this is what you're going to do. This is the outcome. Amen? You guys with me? All right, Numbers chapter 13, verse 23 and following says, Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, and there cut down a branch with a cluster of grapes, and they carried it between the two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, <clears throat> they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him, then, he, then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It is truly flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruits. So here so far, everything's good. We're in the land, just as you said it is, flowing with milk and honey, wonderful place. Then we get nevertheless. Here's our spy friend. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified, and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. <clears throat> All right, sounds good? Not so quick. But the men who had gone up there with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw a the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Not very good, nevertheless. Amen? So when you consider, this is a promised land. Amen? This is land that if God's sending you to it, He's going to give it to you. Amen? But you're going to have to make application of faith, not fear. And so to understand that, you know, there was 12, 5, 12 spies. They experienced Canaan, and it was just as God said. Amen? I really like that, you know, 
when they had the branch, they pulled down them grapes, they put them on a pole, there's a couple guys, they're just snacking away, man. They're just, they're like tourists in this wonderful land till their eyes start to see things and their physical abilities start to try to navigate a God-sized problem. Amen? And so, understand, this was promised, so the spies, you're listening to guys that are your worst enemy. They're your worst enemy because they're, they're looking at things and they're processing it. Nobody asks them to go in there and analyze. Come back and report what's there and, be, and, be, and quiet yourself. They witness God's promises right in front of them. You know what? But they weren't relying on God's protection, were they? Amen? They weren't relying on God's protection. How many of you know that if you're going to try to accomplish anything for God, that he's going to call you to, that he's, got, that he's promised, you're going to have to rely on his protection also. Amen? You, you know there's an opposition to anything that God wants to do? There's an opposition. And so if you look at it within your ability to navigate it yourself, you're going to fall far short of that ability. But if God has given it over to you into your hands, it's as good as yours. You just have to do what he says. But the naysayers in this were a majority, right? Because they had an influence on these folks, the congregation, right? So the spies nevertheless had this promise of God squelched, right? Man, I hate church votes and stuff. You, do you hear what I'm telling you? Because you don't know who's going to view something, and where are they spiritually? Where is somebody spiritually? Because you understand, to walk by faith is a big deal, right? Being sure of things hoped for and certain of things unseen. It's not easy to do that if you're living in the world, right? So if you're living in the world, you're of the world, right? We're supposed to be in the world but not of the world, right? But if you're living in the world and you're really of the world, walking by faith's not going to be top on your list. You hear what I'm telling you, right? I used an analogy this week that I, I believe it was D.L. Moody that, that said it originally. Was it D.L. Moody? Is that what I said? D.L. Moody? Um, he was talking about being in the world but not of the world. And the, the picture was a great one. It's easy to get your mind wrapped around it. Is that if you can imagine a boat, a boat spends its time in the water because that's what it's designed for, water. It's designed to float on the water, right? But it's not designed to take on water. Because if it takes on water, it's going to sink, right? So the boat that spends time in the water, it's designed to be in the water, can't take on water, because if it does, it will sink. It's to be in the world, but not of the world. If you become of the world, you're going to sink. Amen? Are you with me? That makes very simple sense, doesn't it? Very, you know, methodically simple, we can understand. So when you're trying to analyze things that God is giving us that requires faith to accomplish, we can't be sunk in accomplishment. We think stupid when we think in our own abilities if we believe that we have to deliver ourselves. We're in trouble, right? So we had this wonderful lady in our church who believed that, that God was going to do something that he promised us, and we started forth to accomplish. And she had that rock, and I remember that day walking in there, and when those papers were signed, and I seen that nevertheless rock sitting on there. Nevertheless. Well, that's a different nevertheless than the one we just heard, amen? The one we just heard were some naysayers. And you know what we had back in them days? Naysayers. Oh, yeah. We had the voices that were like... The, Weren't there enough graves where we came from? You had to come over here to die, right? We heard all those. But as well as we heard those, we heard a group of people that 
that believed if God took us to it, he was going to take us through it. Amen? And so to press forward, we had to understand that God wanted to accomplish some things, and he would do it. I'm going to read you another story, and I think it's, it's a wonderful picture to kind of get your mind wrapped around. It really takes us. We really got to come to a place to understand you got to be the voice like Caleb was in this story. Caleb came in and he's, he got the people's calm down. He said, listen, act like you got some sense. Calm down. We're going in there and we're going to take over the land. God said so. All right? They're probably ready to pick up stones and throw it at him, right? But nevertheless, that was the right answer. That's not the one they picked. And so when we consider in our lives, there's going to be a lot of naysayers. We need, to be, we need to be like this, what you're going to hear right now. Now understand, God's going to challenge us with things that sound ridiculous. You, you know what? A good measurement to gauge if God's involved in something, I think one of the requirements is that it needs to sound ridiculous. Because if you can do it without him, he's probably not in it. Considering that the whole concept of the redempted individual on planet Earth to stay here, to be in the world but not of the world, is to show Jesus through your life. And if he can show it through your life and you don't need him to accomplish it, then how do they see Jesus? So what happens is he allows circumstances that we can't have an answer for to come into our lives so he can manifest his power through us. Make sense? So, easier said than done a lot of times. This is a simple story. I've I've used this passage of scripture and preached it a lot of different ways. Today I just want to take a look at a word in there that's our famous word here. It's nevertheless. Nevertheless. And this is the New King James Version I'm reading from tonight, because the words I picked from the text in the original language, they match up really well, right? Nevertheless is a great word, right? Nevertheless, you know, just kind of for us to to understand, when something looks like it's impossible, you know, just, it's kind of like this, despite the facts, right? It's like, We're taking on huge water, (laughs) and and we're starting to go down. Despite that, it's a beautiful day, (laughs) right? Despite that, and then God does something amazing, and you find out that you're rolled up on a sandbar, and you're fine, right? What was certain doom suddenly changes at the nevertheless of God, amen? Amen. So listen to this one. This is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. So it was, as a multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, and he stood by the lake of Gerasenet, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen (coughs) had gone from them and were washing their nets. When he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out just a little bit from the land. And he sat down, and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered him and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they had caught a great number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Now that's the right kind of nevertheless. Amen? That's quite a different nevertheless. If we believe God at his word, amen, all things are possible with God. Amen? If we listen and obey, how about that? That kind of nevertheless. Well, I come down on the floor with you for a little bit. Can you imagine on your spiritual journey and the things that God calls and asks us to do, just the compliant 
Nevertheless, at your word, I'll throw the nets down. Never mind we've spent an hour cleaning them up. Never mind that we're completely fatigued from doing this all night. We're completely frustrated because we have no wages coming in from the night's worthless amount of work. But enough respect for the master to say, nevertheless, at your word, throw them nets in. Amen? So let's break that down practically in our lives. How many of you think you have that attitude? Man, I'm going to tell you I don't. I'm going to tell you right now I don't. Listen, I, I read these scriptures. Hey, listen, do everything without arguing and complaining. Consider pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds. Because trying to give your faith to fellow perseverance. Molarchy is what I'm thinking in the middle of it. It's the truth. It's rock solid. You can stand on it, but it's difficult to live it. Unless you get your mind wrapped around the big picture. Right? We're all subject to this body that we live in. We all have the same circumstances that befall us. The problem is we're spinning our wheels. You know, we don't even realize. Do you understand for these fishermen not to have caught one stinking fish that Jesus probably had something to do with that uneventful night? Perhaps sent the fish on another journey somewhere? Because the impact was zero fish to torn nets. You hear what I'm telling you? And the impact should be from us in this moment, in our lives, when we consider the things that God calls us to do, is that he puts us in a place that we have to say, nevertheless, despite my circumstances, despite my opinions, my ideas, my frustration, my anger, my bitterness. Despite all that garbage, nevertheless, at your word. So let's let that simmer for a minute. A good friend, pastor, buddy of mine, that he was a guy from a church that when I first got saved, he's a pastor now in Colorado. I love the guy. Because God has done amazing things. Man, he's seen some crazy stuff in his life. His son got killed by a train. I remember the, his godly wife sitting him down and telling him when the police cars were pulling up front, the Spirit of God talked to her, spoke to her heart and said, what's coming in the door now is horrific news. She grabbed a hold of him and said, I don't care what we hear, we're going to stick close to God. He's a pastor. He's an amazing individual. But he, he likes to debunk all sorts of things that people say. It's just not the right answer. They're, they're churchy things that people say, like this one. Um, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And it really is this, God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not has no bearing on it at all. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I love the guy because that's my kind of thinking. Because we get in the way, we put ourselves in a place as though we have some bearing on the validity of what God said, right? We have no bearing whatsoever. God said it, that settles it. So if I understand, if he said, drop the nets, drop the nets. So if we take that into practical speaking in our life, and he gives directives. He gives us, you know, the scripture says, if, if we love him, we'll obey him. Not kind of wink, wink. If we love him, we'll obey him. As he navigates our life, as he commands us from what would look like a desolate situation to end up in a prosperous situation at the command of the master at the most ridiculous sounding things you have ever heard. He's going to tell you to do things that don't make any sense. He's going to tell you to do things that will get you ridiculed. Can you imagine being on a fishing boat with the crew that's on there after you just cleaned up all those nets and they're laying on the deck? And all of a sudden, the boss stands up and says, throw the nets over, guys. 
You're not going to hear anything coming back out of that? You ever been on a construction site? You hear what I'm telling you? But in this story, you see compliance. And then you've seen the hand of God do something amazing. And I say for us, if we could consider the directives of God that he wants to steer our lives, that we wouldn't be like our first group of people, that the spies come in and they say, hey, listen, never mind that God said that this is going to be your land. Never mind that. Never mind that the fruit we were carrying around was pretty delightful, amen? Never mind that. But there's giants in the land, there's all sorts of other, that's, that's a, there's a bunch of people there too, man. You know, so let's just scrap that idea. How many of us give up on God that way? How many of us got our own nevertheless? Well, God said this, but nevertheless, you don't understand. I got to deal with my friends. I got to deal with my, all my friends. What are they going to say? They're going to ridicule me if I say this. Right? We're, we tend to go to that nevertheless camp. Right? God said it. That should what? Settle it. And so if we can get our mind wrapped around it, if God said it, that settles it. If he promised the land, I don't give a hoot what I see. I want to be like David was when he confronted Goliath, right? When he seen himself not as a boy that was incapable of handling anything, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And he drew up his stones. And next thing you know, he had a giant laying on the ground with his head cut off at the hand of a little boy and an almighty God. And so when you understand what it is to get your mind wrapped around, if God said it, that settles it. And so when we consider what it is to maybe be fatigued, maybe you got things going on in life, and it's real. Maybe you're trying to be a testimony to people, and and the world's just beating you up. Right? And God gives you instruction, and you, and you know, you don't understand, God. We made this net in the water all night. It's going to rot. We bring it in and out of the water another time. You know, we don't want net rot. Come on. If you're going to do a miracle, God, can't you just make the fish jump in the boat and we leave the net on the deck? I mean, a miracle's a miracle, right? Are you guys with me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Don't we say stupid stuff just like this? God, why do I got to go through these motions? Because he says, you are going to participate. That's why. You're going to act by faith. And your response by faith is going to be seen by a lost world. They're going to see you. They're going to say, you're nuts. You're ridiculous. You're out of your mind. Until the net tears. Do you hear me? Until they see a move of God that's so powerful that it's undeniable. And in the instant, what happens? In an instant, they know. They know that it's God working through you. That's why we're here, folks. That's why we're on the planet. That's why we're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. That's what this is all about. It's not about all the stuff we make it about, right? We make it about things that are so dumb. There's a lost world out there, and God has entrusted us to go get them. Amen? He wants us to go get them. Act like we got a lick of sense. We don't act like we got a lick of sense half the time. Because our circumstances, folks, listen to what I'm trying to tell you. Our circumstances are that real. You're not playing Little League with the devil. You hear what I'm telling you? He's here to take you out, kill, steal, destroy. That's reality. But the mission is worthwhile. You say, well, you don't understand all the circumstances I have to go through. Oh, my family, man, they're against me. You know, and I've got all these people that are around me at work. They think I'm a nut job, right? And my friends, what friends? 
Listen, I'm just telling you. You know what I, I find great comfort in? Jesus. <laughs> you know, the author and the perfecter of our faith, right? Whom for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know what? Guess here's a revelation for you. He endured the cross to endure the joy. Amen? All right. So when I consider what I'm talking about, this nevertheless, a movement that God would do through our lives, if we can get our mind wrapped around, if God said it, that settles it. So when my circumstances are grim, the stage is set for a move of the Almighty. Are you with me? So in other words, Christians run away from when God has set the stage to show the world Jesus. Are you guys with me? Sometimes I think I'm out of my mind. I, I do, man. I just feel, you know, sometimes I just feel like, to me, it's black and white as can be. This world is going to hell in a handbag. It's happening right in front of our eyes. And we got to wake up and say, all right, Lord, if I'm here, I'm going to have to stand on it nevertheless to get your job done because I can't do it. But you left me here so that I can do it through Christ. Right? So if that's the case, let me get into the game. Quit, let me, you know, I used to get on the pity pot all the time growing up in my faith. You know, my, the first pastor I was under at the time, man, he would tell me all the time, you need to get off that pity pot. I want to sit down there every now and then. You're going to get yourself a rash or blisters or something. But the truth is, the very thing that I was running from was the things that God was trying to do in and through my life to say, I want to show Jesus through you to those people. Remember those people from your past? Don't you want to see them redeemed? Then let them see the Redeemer in you. Right? We can do that if we'll listen and obey God. Amen? Well, I think the, the grand finale of all neverthelesses. The one, the, the one that just really shows us the picture, right, against everything. I, I heard, I heard a, a preacher preaching, and he was talking about something that's really been a hot spot for me lately, and it, it, it's the word worship, right? The word worship. And in sanctuaries across the U.S. in particularly, because our culture is, we're nothing but spoiled brats. I'm just going to tell you straight out. We cry over everything that we're just spoiled. We don't, don't get what we want. We need our little yucky, you know. Because we're American. It's the culture, right? We need to have all, everything. Comfort, everything. Lazy boy chair, the whole nine yards, right? And he was talking about worship. And the guy goes, you know what worship is? You know what worship is? Worship. Worship is when you deny yourself when God said, he wants you to accomplish something, and you know his word has given you a directive, and you say no to yourself to accomplish his first purpose. That's worship to God. Amen? So what we do in the church when we're floating around like butterflies, and, and all not, nothing against singing to the Lord, nothing against it at all. But it's where's our heart? Do you hear? Is, is our lives altered based on what we believe about God, what we believe about a lost world and those that are here, do we believe that they're destined to a place called hell outside of Christ? Do we believe he's given us ability to run interference for them to show the Jesus who rescued us? Do we believe that? If we do, we better hang on to some never less than lessons. It was interesting today. I'm just going to leave the person's name anonymous because I don't want to embarrass anybody. I never do that, right, Drew? But it was one of the children at, at pantry today that was working that was really getting upset because they didn't want to have to go in the back and work in the one room, the processing room, was getting really upset to tears and said these words. said, I really don't want to. And it was a very dramatic scene, and it, that's not a good place for me at all. I excused myself at that point. Anyway, but one of our people that's a faithful, regular Jojo, who is just as real as it gets. If anybody knows Jojo, you'll know what I'm talking about. She's going to tell you straight up, this is how it is. 
and that's what she did. She simply said, she simply said, well, I'd rather be on a beach somewhere, but guess what? I'm not. I'd rather be doing whatever, whatever. And sometimes in life, we got to do things we don't want to do. Let's go. Amen? That's, that's pretty straight talk. It's pretty straight talk, but the truth is sometimes we do have to do things we don't want to do. And we understand the magnitude of what you're hearing here tonight. I'm going to give you the last nevertheless that's made an impact in my world. And it's, it's probably the most powerful movement that shook me to the core and continues to do so. Found in Mark chapter 14, verse 32 to 36, says this. Then they came to the place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here for while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him. And he began, he, he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but your will. Wow. Where are we at with that one? Nevertheless, not my will but yours. Do you understand the depth of that? <laughs> That's rough stuff. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's what the scripture says. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh in its passions and desires. Have we crucified them, folks? Jesus had to crucify himself emotionally before he ever went into the garden. Do you understand that? You, can you imagine what was going on? Can you imagine the turmoil in his mind as he's really started to allow the weight of a Roman crucifixion to bear down on him as he understood this is reality and it's going to happen shortly. As these guys are here, and, and we know as we read through the Gospels, we know that they fell asleep on him and he was greatly distressed. But if you can imagine the magnitude of that moment for him, and then here comes Judas, the betrayer. Here he comes. And Jesus knows, what's he say? Do what you're here for, friend. And he has to endure a kiss from the one that's betraying him. And if you don't think that there was emotional distress in that, if you don't understand the magnitude of what happened in that moment, heavy, heavy stuff. Maybe we would parallel that in our own lives and consider when we were betrayed by a friend. And all we want to do is have revenge instead of accomplish the very purpose of God because Jesus knew that in God's ultimate plan, that kiss was required. Amen? He had to deal with it. You know what else? Can you imagine when the, when the soldiers came in and he sees them. And then you got Peter draws a sword and cuts an ear off. And Jesus is still focused on shepherding his disciples. And he picks the ear up and places it back on the soldier. And all the penalty and anything that would have come of that was neutralized in a second in his distress when he knew the next thing that he was going to experience was severe beating, flogging as his flesh was torn from his body. He knew that was coming down the tracks. Do you hear what I'm telling you? 
and in the midst of people that make harsh movements, they do things recklessly, spiritually, that we need to keep our mind wrapped around accomplishing the purposes of God in and through our lives. Amen? And I'm going to tell you what, Jesus was the picture of humble as he was humiliated. As, as he, anybody that was the onlookers bore everything that happened to our Lord Jesus. He was our example, amen? That nevertheless, that nevertheless, the Jesus said to God the Father, changed our eternal existence. Amen? What do you think of that? You're going to have an opportunity as you go from this place and as you try to make application out of what you heard here, you're going to have to an opportunity to consider, nevertheless. You, you can take the scriptures and you can, you can make application of God said it, what? That settles it. And then you don't have to worry about being the nevertheless that says all this nonsense that we just, we talk about what our physical eyes can see. The obvious, it's like, Hey, Drew, I noticed there's some chairs here. Can you imagine? We say ridiculous things. God says, I'm going to clear the way from you. Right? I'm going to hem you in between an army and a body of water. And then at the command, the water's going to part. But you can't get there until you've seen the water and you can hear the breath of the Savior. You hear what I'm telling you? And so this journey of faith that we're on, these neverthelesses that we put in, I'm telling you, if you can get on top of your thinking and understand this truth, the scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight. So if you're relying on your ability to navigate this journey of earth, you know, everything that God's laid out for us, and you think you're going to mastermind it without talking to the one who directs us? or without yielding to the Holy Spirit of God, that you may be moving in a direction to accomplish something, and God would say, yield. Right? Yield. I had a brother in our Wednesday night Bible study. He was talking about he was supposed to give a testimony someplace. And he, and he was halted from the night. He was really aggravated with the ministry team that wouldn't let him speak until he was there on a different night that he shared his testimony, and it, it had a huge impact in somebody's life. But you understand that God said yield because the wrong ears are here tonight. And the right ears are going to be here the night that you're going to share. You hear what I'm saying? And so for us to understand what it is to be led by the Spirit to say, if God said it, that settles it. If His Spirit that indwells us, if the Bible says, if you are a born-again believer, if you received salvation, redemption, if Jesus Christ has entered you through by way of you receiving forgiveness, by asking for God's forgiveness and recognizing Jesus as the Son of God, that he died on a cross for your sin. He rose on the third day for penalty for the penalty of your sin. He paid the debt, and God's deposit is the Holy Spirit of God. That indwelling Holy Spirit will shake your cage. He'll direct your steps. You've got to listen for him. You've got to forget the neverthelesses that go against what the Scripture teaches. And you got to adopt the neverthelesses that says, I'm counting on right now, God. I'm looking at the odds. And it, I'm, I don't have to be a rocket scientist. And I don't have to be a mathematician to be able to figure this out. This isn't going to work in and of myself. Great. The stage is set for the Almighty to make a wave right now. And so instead of saying, God, change my circumstances, I'm like, God, can you exaggerate them a little bit more? Can you make it completely, abundantly clear that when I get freed from this mess, there is no way, no question, there was no way out, and you freed me to show the power of the Almighty? Let the nevertheless, when I say, oh, there's no way, everybody says, you're doomed, there's no way you can get out of here, then it's like, oh, praise God, because I'm waiting for the nevertheless. Because when the nevertheless gets here, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to eat your words. 
after each of your words as I show you Jesus. And then, and then instead of, you know, you know, gloating in that, instead of that, I'm going to humbly come to you and say, God has allowed this today so that I could tell you about the one who died for you. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because everything he gives us an opportunity to be part of is so that he can show his son to this world through your life. That's the general theme, and when I'm preaching, you're going to hear that kind of a message every time you come through the door. You're going to hear that how what I'm talking about affects your life to give God the glory as you show the world his son. Amen? Well, I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know where you came from. I don't know, you know, where you are spiritually. But I know this. Every time I preach, I give an invitation. I give an opportunity for somebody to respond And be able to, you know, consider, is my life a picture of excuses of why I can't believe what the Scripture says? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's somebody in here tonight who's never called upon Jesus to be their Savior. And you need redemption through Christ. So that what you cannot do for yourself that he has already done for you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? But if you've done that and you're here and you're on a journey and and you read the scriptures and there's a huge, huge gap between your life and what they say, why would we tighten it up? And say, I don't want to be the nevertheless person that says, yeah, but you don't understand my life. Get rid of that garbage. Say, God, I want to stand on the truths that you want to show your son through my life. God, I want to be used in that way. Help me to have the courage to be that person. If that's you, why don't you come up? Counselors, come on up here. We're going to hear a little bit of music. We'll give it a little bit of time before we close. But don't go out of the door and make excuses why God's not doing something in and through your life. I promise you this. God leads you to something and it's difficult, he's going to take you through it. And there's going to be a nevertheless tied to it. Amen? As the music plays, would you come?